So thanks uh, very much uh, for the, the, the kind and uh, detailed introduction and, and for the uh, invitation to speak here. Um, as Dan noted, I'm not a scientist. Uh, so it's always refreshing for me to join a scientific meeting where the quality of the presentations uh, is so high. Because indeed, I do spend a lot of my time looking at individuals and at organizations and businesses that rely on doing very poor science. They do experiments without controls. They extrapolate directly from in vitro uh, results and take them straight into human uh, use. They frequently commercialize these in ways that are designed to evade or even um, attack regulations in their local jurisdictions. And so I've been looking for the past 10 years or so, both at the industry, that I think is one of the greatest threats um, confronting the field of stem cell research, and at the ways that different countries are trying to, to get that industry uh, under some control. So today I'll be talking about four kind of main issues. Um, the first is particularly important here in the US, which is, I, as Dan mentioned, I'm based in Japan, but I'm an American. Um, this phenomenon used to be called stem cell tourism. Now most people call it direct-to-consumer stem cell marketing. Uh, continues to thrive in the US. There are hundreds and hundreds of businesses in almost every state in the country that make these aggressive and unsubstantiated claims about clinical uses of stem cells. Um, there have been a number, uh, the second point is that uh, regulatory agencies in different countries have actually started to respond to this, probably um, respond too late for a lot of people's um, satisfaction, but they are indeed beginning to respond, including the US FDA. Um, we are seeing some activity in the development uh, of R&D pipelines of companies that actually are trying to do things in a responsible and scientific manner, compliant with our local regulatory schemes. Um, so I'll talk a bit about that. And then I'll talk uh, for the, the ending few slides uh, about things to watch for in the future, both in, with respect to regulation, but also things that I'm starting to see uh, on the dark side of stem cell land, where there are people making these new um, new sorts of claims uh, with, uh, for old sorts of purposes. So um, my, my colleagues and friend, uh, Lee Turner at uh, University of Minnesota and Paul Knopfler at UC Davis, of course, published a very famous paper in Cell Stem Cell in 2016, which looked at the number and the locations of these businesses that market stem cells direct to consumers. Um, more recently, earlier this year, they published a follow-up to that paper where they actually tracked kind of the, uh, the evolution of the industry over time. And so they found now in 2018 that there are, uh, as opposed to about 500 businesses in 2016, they found 700 businesses in 2018 that are making these kinds of claims. And uh, indeed, if you look at the map, you can see that Southern California is really one of the hot spots. Historically, one of the reasons for that is a lot of these businesses started as stem cell tourism businesses where they would recruit locally but actually do the treatments, in, in this case in Tijuana or other parts of northern Mexico. You had the same kind of pattern happening in Florida where the partner of businesses would have been in the Caribbean. But what's happened in recent years is there's been this onshoring. So it's no longer necessarily an international tourism um, activity. There's lots of activity domestic here in the US where the patients don't even have to leave their own town. Um, and so that's been really a, a, a major transformation in the um, industry and one of the reasons why people don't use that term stem cell tourism so much anymore. Um, another area uh, that we've seen changes uh, happen in, in recent years uh, is the country where I live, Japan, which many of you may know introduced a number of regulatory changes what they call regulatory reforms back in 2014. Uh, I'll talk about uh, the reforms to their pharmaceutical affairs law, basically their drug regulation law later in the presentation. But they introduced a new law in 2014 called the Act on the Safety of Regenerative Medicine. And this was focused on the private practice clinics, not on businesses that were seeking to develop a drug or a new cellular biologic, but on basically mom and pop individual doctors or small, uh, small uh, medical practices that were delivering cell therapies that had not gone through an approval process, uh, but were not seeking reimbursement from the National Insurance um, Program, and were not seeking to distribute these products throughout the, the healthcare system. So for historical uh, reasons, and I think for some philosophical reasons, those are regulated differently in Japan 
than businesses that want to make a drug that will get reimbursement and will be distributed on a national basis. So uh, the, the Act on the Safety Return of Medicine, or ASRM as it's usually called, uh, was passed in 2014. And what it did was introduce a risk-based kind of a tiered system where they had class one, class two, and class three regenerative medicine technologies. Class one were considered to be the highest risk ones, which would be things like iPS cells or genetically modified or xenogenetic cells or embryonic stem cells. Class three uh, essentially is non-stem cells. And I think in most interpretations, it's autologous ones. And so there, of course, had been already some activity in this space, which was the reason that this law came into existence. But what we actually saw since the passage of the law was kind of a legitimate, uh, legitimating um, effect of the law now coming in, into, into place where clinics w that claim to be offering the safest, the low-risk class three type cell-based interventions, um, essentially could organize their own IRB, report the results of their IRB um, review to the ministry without any kind of feedback or any necessitation uh, or a necessity of getting an approval. They could simply say, this is what we're doing. This is the result of our, an IRB, which is frequently a private IRB that they convened in-house. And um, they would go directly into the market as long as they didn't collect insurance or didn't uh, collect reimbursement from the insurance program. And as long as they didn't sell to other clinics, they essentially were free to do that. And I wrote recently with uh, Hideyuki Okuno at the uh, Keio University that now the ministry has begun to take notice of this and the fact that there isn't much transparency. There's not a lot of information about the nature of these businesses. There's not a lot of information about the nature of the cells they are using, claiming to use, or the nature of the uh, diseases that they're claiming to treat. Um, what is publicly available is the uh, IRBs themselves had to be registered. So we started to look at the IRBs. What we found was, although this is called a Regenerative Medicine Act, about 20% of the IRBs are actually associated with cancer uh, clinics. So what we're seeing is that, although the name of the act is Regenerative Medicine, we're seeing a lot of can cancer uh, cellular immunotherapies kind of sliding in as non-stem cell cell therapies that are being offered, again, on a direct consumer basis patients pay out of pocket to get these NK cells or cytotoxic T cells, which have not gone through an approvals process but are being uh, marketed for cancer treatment. Um, after that paper came out, the ministry also published some data, which is there in Japanese and also in a tiny font. You can't read it. But it indicates that in the time since the passage of the law up to the time they collected the data in spring of 2016, um, 33,000 patients had been treated with 77,000 plus doses of these class three so-called regenerative medicine procedures. Mm -hmm. Although notably, many of them are not going to be stem, classical stem cell type cell replacement. Many of these, we don't know of course the percentage yet, but many will presumably be um, cell therapies for cancer. Um, that's just the number of patients. Um, Australia has been a third country where the, we've seen this growth in the domestic marketing, so the non-tourism the non type of uh, stem cell marketing. And this has been, uh, again, kind of the result of a historical, um, uh, not an accident, but a, a historical feature of regulation in, in Australia where the Therape uh, Therapeutic Goods Administration, the Australian FDA, essentially uh, a number of years back said they did not consider autologous cell or tissue products to be drugs in the classic sense, and therefore they would not regulate them. They essentially said, we are going to delegate this to people who are in charge of looking after medical practice rather than those uh, us who look after medical products. And because of this fairly large loophole in the law, we began to see this growth domestically in Australia of dozens of clinics that are marketing autologous cells. Interestingly, in Australia, there's no, until recently, there's been no limit on what you could do with autologous cells. So there was at least one company which was claiming to do something which appeared to be generating uh, autologous IPS cells and using them to treat diseases by actually injecting the IPS cells, not derivatives of IPS cells, but with some idea that pluripotent cells are good for making you younger again. Um, so these three countries have actually seen, uh, which 
if you think about it, it's Australia, Japan, and the United States, you would not think of these as the traditional homes of stem cell tourism, which if you went 10 years back would be places like Mexico or Thailand or China or Ukraine or someplace. So the landscape of the industry has shifted dramatically in just the past five years or so. And a lot of it has been in response either to changes in regulation or to gaps in existing regulation. Um, and this is just a brief explanation about kind of the old style of the stem cell tourism industry, which frequently involved international travel of people from rich countries going to uh, uh, businesses in poorer countries. Frequently those poorer countries didn't have any laws on the books with uh, respect to cell therapies. They used diverse, they would advertise diverse cell types from bone marrow derived either hematopoietic or mesenchymal stem cells, fetal cells, cord blood, some would even advertise embryonic uh, stem cells. Um, fairly even mix back in the day of allogeneic and autologous um, cell types. And uh, they would make direct claims about the therapeutic uh, efficacy of their products. And the treatment costs, interestingly, were much higher back in the day. In the earliest days, you would see them well over $100,000. For, for some number of years, that stabilized, stabilized in the $20,000 to $30,000 range. But now in the new model, almost all of those things have changed. Now we see much more domestic <laughs> delivery, so people can go to uh, clinics that are located in a strip mall right in their own town. Um, we see there's much more coordination within the industry, so you see franchises, you see lobbying groups starting to emerge, you see astroturfing initiatives uh, on social media and other platforms. And um, one of the big developments in the industry has been Almost all of the businesses now market what they claim to be mesenchymal stem cells or stromal cells, or what some people now call medicinal signaling cells. They use this MSC acronym, either from bone marrow, its classical source, or increasingly now from fat. And it's almost all autologous. And another important uh, advance or a change that's been made by the industry is that very few of these businesses now actually make therapeutic claims. Almost all of them, or an increasing fraction of them, maybe not all of them, now claim to do some variant of this thing called pay-to-participate research, where they say, we're currently studying the use of adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells in Parkinson's disease, or stroke, or diabetes, or what have you. If you want to join our clinical study, which is there on clinicaltrials.gov, you can go take a look at it, pay us $8,000, and you can become a research subject. And this has been a, a brilliant innovation for the industry because it allows them, one, to promise nothing, which protects them from uh, litigation and has successfully uh, indemnified them against a number of uh, attempts uh, by patients to sue clinics for fraud because they can say, look at the informed consent. It says we're studying it. We don't know. Is it safe? We don't know. If it works, therefore, you know, you've essentially signed away your rights to claim that we didn't tell you so. And I think partly because of the large increase in the number of businesses engaged in this practice, uh, the costs have actually dropped. And you can frequently find businesses that offer stem cell injections for the $3,000 to $5,000 range in the US now. Um, that's not to say there haven't been safety issues. I, again, small font, uh, you can't see all the text. But over the past 10 years or so, we've seen a number of sometimes well-publicized cases we saw in the New England Journal just in the past year or so, the cases of the, the uh, elderly people who had been blinded uh, by the injected, uh, injection of so-called fat stem cells into their, retina, uh, into their retinas. Um, there was a patient also published in the, uh, a case based, uh, published in the New England Journal of a man who suffered paralysis after he developed a tumor. That was probably from an injection of fetal cells um, but there have been cases, of course, of death and uh, other serious uh, injuries like encephalopathies uh, over the years. So that's the kind of thing that does attract uh, regulatory attention. Um, I noticed when I was looking at the program that the, a lot of the talks today are actually about cancer and cancer stem cells. So I published a paper just uh, last year that talks about the stem cell marketing, the direct-to-consumer marketing industry, as kind of a cancer on the field. It's, in the same way that cancer is a caricature of development or physiology, this is kind of a caricature of good stem cell research. And it does, and maybe this is the English literary, uh, English major in me uh, coming up, but it's kind of an extended metaphor that compares the way that 
cancers protect itself from the immune system and regulation by the body. And uh, these kind of uh, toxic businesses protect themselves against regulation and the healthy immune system of, of science. So if, if I had given this talk last year, I would have been very um, pessimistic about the prospects because of the lobbying efforts that were going on and because of the success of uh, these businesses at making money and starting to wield uh, political influence, uh, I would have, been, would have been pessimistic about the um, prospects for increased regulatory oversight. And indeed, I wrote a number of papers, one with Paolo Bianco, who's no longer with us, that talked about some of the factors and some of the ways that the industry was organizing and coordinating with other um, ideological groups that were, uh, for economic reasons, opposed to the idea of federal regulation of drugs, essentially using stem cells as kind of a wedge issue to attack the requirement for um, proof of efficacy before uh, you can go onto the American market with a new drug product. Uh, however, happily, I can report that there have been a number of new developments where different countries have taken steps to try to react to this toxic industry. So uh, in, I think it was February of this year, I published with, with Dr. Okono, I mentioned uh, a paper in Cell Stem Cell that talks about some of the attempts that the Japanese Ministry of Health, uh, Labor, and Welfare has made to at least increase transparency uh, and increase c compliance with both the uh, ASRM, which regulates the private practice clinics, and uh, appears to be tightening the screws on the conditional approves pathway, which they approved at the same, uh, which they passed at the same time. So uh, what they essentially did is re uh, increase the amount of reporting requirements that businesses need to go through now when they go onto the market with um, unproven uh, cell therapies, even if they're not collecting insurance reimbursement, and even if they're not distributing, and even if they're in that supposedly lowest risk category. And the, uh, it's also been interesting to see uh, what's happened with Japan's conditional approvals pathway, which I said I would get to. Um, many of you may have heard that in 2015, Japan approved a product which essentially had only gone through a phase one slash early phase two trial with an N equals seven study, which had at a very questionable level barely met its, uh, its uh, primary endpoint, but it was based on this idea that um, Japan was going to prioritize the development and commercialization of regenerative medicine products. What they did was they had a product that was called a cell sheet of uh, skeletal myoblasts that they used in chronic heart failure. It got on the market for up to, uh, for, for five years. And during that five year period, what the law essentially says is the sponsor of the clinical trial, the sponsor of the product, has to continue to collect data to support whether there is actual efficacy. But interestingly, they can also collect reimbursement as if it had been fully approved. So there's this product that's on the market in Japan. It's only been tested in seven people. It costs about $130,000 a shot. And it didn't really do well in its clinical trial. So people uh, back then, both in the industry and in the field, were concerned that this was going to kind of skew the market. It was going to bring a flood of uh, Me Too products, but also uh, products in other categories that might have a weak evidence base and get into that lucrative um, conditional approval space. But what we've seen since then is that there hasn't been a single product approved, and there hasn't been a lot of uh, recruitment into that conditional um, post-market um, testing phase for the, the single product that is there on the market. So we'll see in 2020 whether that gets bumped into a full approval or is withdrawn from the market due to lack of data. Um, but it, I, I can say that the fears that Japan would either become a juggernaut or would become kind of this, this, uh, this uh, black hole vacuuming up all of the promising technologies from other um, countries hasn't borne out in reality, at least to date. Uh, in a number of other countries, we started to see some, some even stronger language looking at the local um, marketing of stem cells. Uh, India has been publishing national guidelines since about 2006. They most recently updated them last year. And these are influential guidelines, although they don't have the force of law. Uh, they're published by the in uh, India Council on Medical Research and the Department of Biotechnology. And they came out in this 
most recent um, instance of the guidelines, and they said any use of stem cells other than the well-established uses of uh, hematopoietic stem cells in diseases of the blood and immune system are considered malpractice. We haven't seen a case yet in the courts uh, in India, so that hasn't been tested about how influential it's going to be, but it looks like a step in the right direction. Um, I have heard also in Thailand that there is now a, a, a bill sitting on the prime minister's desk which essentially uh, would criminalize uh, these kind of unproven uses of uh, stem cells by uh, licensed medical professionals in Thailand. Uh, that again has not been passed into law and due to some of the, the political situation in Thailand, it's not really clear when that will actually happen, but it at least has been written up as a bill and uh, been seen at the highest levels of government. Oops. And of course, here in the US, we saw some very happy news coming out of the uh, FDA uh, in uh, November of last year, where they finally were able to finalize a number of what they call draft, at the time were draft guidance documents, now they're final guidance documents for really critically important uh, definitions and characteristics of how the FDA views cell and tissue products and whether they sh shall be regulated as biologics or simply under a good tissue practice. Um, the, probably the most important, I don't have time to go into all of the details of these, but the key definitions here are whether the product is more than minimally manip manipulated in a way that changes its biological properties, whether it's being used for non-homologous use. Um, it, one of the guidances was not really about definitions of, that result in uh, a decision about whether it's biological or not, but whether um, adipose tissue is essentially metabolic or is essentially a structure, kind of cushioning tissue. But I think the most important one that they refined was their clarification about what is the meaning of the same surgical procedure exception. So if you look at the law in, in the US, there is a single phrase in the initial law that says, none of these rules apply if the cell or tissue is harvested and readministered in the course of the same surgical procedure. And that's essentially the, enti the entire level of detail in the statement. What they did in the new, uh, the refined and finalized guidance was they said, same surgical procedure only means sizing, shaping, uh, washing, or rinsing. It doesn't mean anything else. You can't centrifuge, for example. You can't grow the cells in culture. You can't treat them with growth factors. So this is, this is the loophole, I think, the single most important loophole that has been used by clinics in the US for the past five years or so after it was identified one, by one of the businesses that was suing the FDA, essentially. And uh, now that they're closing it, it bodes well for the future. That said, the FDA also afforded clinics that were not compliant with the new guidances to get compliant over the next three years. So there is this kind of a grace period for businesses that are already in operation. We'll see um, how that plays out three years from now. Um, and as I was on the plane on the way here, the FDA commissioner and the, the head of CBER published a paper, which I had to include. Um, so they also are talking about, you know, they acknowledge that there have been safety problems. They acknowledge that there have been problems and lack of efficacy and um, products that have gone through full uh, three-phase clinical trials. Uh, but they also talk about the way that the FDA wants to support the field. They want to support innovation. And um, they uh, mention this program that many of you, you may be familiar with called the RMAT program. Uh, regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapies, which was introduced as part of the uh, 21st Century Cures Act. And I, I was not aware of this until I read this article that came out yesterday, but they um, have granted 13 RMATs now, which is a lot. I thought it was only three. Um, so it's interesting that they actually received 43 requests. So they aren't just rubber stamping every request. It looks that they're actually giving them serious consideration and review, but it's also a sign of progress. And of course, here in California, as many of you also probably are aware, there's a recent law that requires clinics that offer non-FDA approved stem cell product uh, procedures or products or interventions to visibly post the fact so that their patients are aware that they're get going through something that hasn't gone through that kind of a re review process. Washington has a similar, the state of Washington has a similar uh, law now under discussion. So, um, the U.S., that said, still does not have an approved stem cell product other than the various cord blood products 
which if you actually look at the approvals are listed as uh, hematopoietic uh, progenitor, not stem cells, uh, and of which there are, I think, seven now on the market in the US. But in other countries, there are four products um, which use the word stem cell uh, in, the, in the product des uh, definition on the market in Korea. Uh, there are two in Japan. Uh, one of those is conditionally approved. And I think a lot of people are not aware there's actually one on the market in India. Um, if you look at the cell type, all of them are various flavors of MSC, whatever you take MSC to mean. About uh, half are autologous, half are uh, allogeneic. Indications are diverse. And um, I do just want to note that the Korean full approvals, they have gotten full market authorization in Korea, but different from Japan, they don't receive reimbursement from the National Insurance Program because the National the Insurance Program decided that the evidence for their efficacy was not adequate to justify paying for them. So they're on the market, but if a patient wants to use them, the patient has to pay the full costs out of pocket. And we're beginning to see these are both uh, very recent news uh, releases that um, other MSC-based products have, one, Mesoblast, announced that it has met its primary endpoint in a phase three clinical trial for GVHD. Uh, and uh, Tygenics also got a, an approval from uh, EMA. Um, the uh, Mesoblast product is for GVHD, and the uh, Tygenics one is for fistulas associated with Crohn's disease. So I mentioned uh, that both in the approved product space and in the, the kind of the, on the dark side of stem cell land, we've seen this convergence on mesenchymal S cells. You can call that stromal or signaling or whatever. Um, now, as many of you may know, this term came into use in 1991. Arnold Kaplan published a paper called Mesenchymal Stem Cells which talked about a fairly limited population of stem cells that were very similar to what previously were called uh, colony form and unit fibroblasts, first reported by Alexander Friedenstein in the 60s and 70s, uh, and essentially identified these as bone marrow-derived cells that were able to give rise to bone cartilage and fat. He then um, he even closed that paper uh, with a section that was called the future, is cell, uh, cell therapy. The following year, he founded uh, the company Osiris Therapeutics, which began the march to commercialize mesenchymal stem cells. Um, but over the years, and I think even fairly rapidly, um, people began to, A, to diversify what that term meant, and some people in the community began to, to question whether it was a, a valid category of stem cells. So whereas the first publication about an MSC was bone marrow derived, basically giving rise to bone uh, cartilage and fat, you began to see claims that they came from other parts of the body, from the fat, from um, deciduous teeth, from menstrual blood or Wharton jelly in the umbilical cord, um, that they gave rise to other types of um, cells on differentiation, that they would home to sites of injury or to sites of tumors, that they secreted various um, bioactive factors, whether they be anti-inflammatory or anti-apoptotic or um, pro-angiogenic. Uh, and so they became this kind of, this almost nebula of not necessarily perfectly overlapping definitions, whether you looked at the gene expression or surface markers or more gross properties like differentiation, you would find that these uh, cells just took on a very broad range of uh, supposed characteristics. But this led groups like the ISCT, the International Society for Cell uh, Therapy, to say, well, hold on, we've got this, this entity that's so vaguely defined that it appears to be capturing cells that are both stem cells and other types of stem cells. So we proposed back in 2005 to stop calling them stem cells and to call them multi-lineage or multipotent um, stromal cells. And so they issued a white paper and a number of labs began to follow that definition. More recently, Arnold Kaplan, uh, as I'll show in a subsequent slide, has also sought to redefine MSC while retaining MSC, the, 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 the capital letters, all of the letters in, in lowercase after that have now changed, except for cells. Cells remains the same. What we've seen in just in the past year or so is a number of what I found to be fairly startling um, publications by people directly involved in the field. One, by Arnold Kaplan himself, 
who published a paper in um, Stem Cells Translational Medicine. Uh, he actually published two papers. I'm quoting from the first one he published. He published a second one, which was titled Time to Change the Name, MSCs are not stem cells. But here is from the um, concluding paragraph of his first paper on the subject. Because of the activities that he's outlined in the, in, the, in the paper, I would argue that MSCs are not stem cells. So this is the guy who named them stem cells, saying they're not stem cells. Pam Roby, who works at the NIH in skeletal stem cells, published in uh, F1000, uh, an even stronger uh, claim that the term MSC, whatever you choose it, to have it mean, should be abandoned because it's confusing and inaccurate. So not only should it not be mesenchymal stem cells, she argues we should stop using mesenchymal stromal cells and uh, uh, Arnold Kaplan's preferred term, medicinal signaling cell. And now just, uh, just a few days ago, Catherine, Le, uh, Catherine Le, LeBlanc, who is a famous MSC researcher, published in Cytotherapy, that it, it's clear now that what we've been calling MSCs coming from all these different tissue sources actually have different properties and different limitations and different advantages. So we need to take account of that, which to me is ind indicative that indeed they may in be different cell types, but there are remains uh, a certain amount of resistance, I think, in the field to letting go of MSCs as a stem cell. Uh, this is important uh, for people in the area that I work, and so right now I'm working on a paper with Lee Turner and uh, Pam Roby uh, for Nature, which is looking basically at the impact of the convergence on the MSC as the kind of the go-to adult stem cell and what's happening now with the MSC where it's kind of collapsing under the weight of all of the, the different properties and, uh, um, and values that have been assigned to it. And it, it's, it's difficult to avoid the, the conclusion that one of the reasons for its, its success uh, and its widespread use has been that it was bruited as kind of the anti-embryonic stem cell, as the ethical cell that you could use. It was from an adult source. You didn't need to work with human embryos or sacrifice an embryo. Uh, and so we see that, for example, NIH funding for mesenchymal stem cells over the past 10 years is only about 1.4% of stem cell research altogether. But more than 10% of stem cell clinical trials are MSC trials. And 50% of uh, the clinics that market stem cells um, claim to use mesenchymal stem cells per se. And indeed, all of the products that are on the market now, except for one, claim to be mesenchymal stem cell products. It looks like I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to run through a number of other issues. Another big challenge for the field is the idea that autologous cells, patients see these as their own property, which I think is kind of a commonsensical uh, thing for patients to believe. Under the law, though, it's not so clear. There is a famous case called Moore versus uh, the, the Regents of the University of California, Los Angeles, where the, the judges essentially found that the cells in your body don't belong to anyone. But once they've been manipulated to the point that they become a different cell, they can belong to someone other than the person they came from, um, which is uh, kind of the basis for a lot of the FDA's rules. But um, clearly, when the guidance documents were being debated um, on online forums, one of the key messages that came out, and I published about this in Regenerative Medicine last year, was that patients view the, cells, the cells to be their own property and not something that the FDA can regulate. Another issue I briefly mentioned is this idea of the pay to participate clinical study, um, which has a number of issues, I think, both for the design of the study, so it has, I think, implications for the science. Um, there are clear ethical issues and there are sociological uh, problems as well. Uh, there have been a number of papers published about this. I published one in 2012. Uh, Lee Turner looked specifically at once at clinics that had registered uh, pay to participate studies of stem cells. Uh, on the NIH database in 2017. So a few things just to watch out for on the horizon. I'll finish up in two minutes. Um, one is the alternative de development pathways that are uh, laid out in the new paper by Scott Gottlieb, the FDA commissioner and the head of uh, CBER, Peter Marks, where they talk about basically doing multi-site studies where they'll pull data from multiple sites using a shared protocol leading to possible multiple, multiple approvals of nominally diff different products. Um, MSC approvals, it looks like there are going to be more and more of these. There are quite a few that are in uh, late stages of clinical testing. 
Um, if MSCs become non-stem cells, that may also have some implications for the stem cell field. Um, this is a big problem that I think a lot of people are not aware of, but um, in late 2017, uh, one of uh, Donald Trump's deputy uh, attorney generals issued a um, memorandum which said that guidance documents would no longer be enforceable uh, as part of civil actions um, by the Justice Department supporting decisions made by federal agencies. This is directly relevant to all that stuff I talked about, how great the new guidance documents are for the FDA, because the Justice Department just said, we won't use those in finding uh, a case of a civil violation of a federal law. She, of course, uh, two weeks later, stepped down to join industry. <laughs> um, biohacking is another thing to keep on, on the horizon. Um, sorry for the uh, racy title. But biohacking is this thing, as you may know, there are people who inject themselves with CRISPR. There are some t people who have injected themselves with stem cells. Um, and it falls in kind of a gray zone because um, it's not really clear who is, whether there's a product being marketed or the entire th thing is being done as kind of a hobbyist basis. Um, watch out for exosomes. I think they're, go they're going to be the next thing coming to the stem cell clinics because they allow you to do cell-free cell therapy. You take the conditioned medium, throw out the cells, inject the, the serum or whatnot, and claim that you're giving people stem cells. Um, all the benefits without the, the junk. Platelet-rich plasma has been around there for a long time, but it's now starting to, A, take on that um, pay-to-participate clinical trial model, and B, move into things like this is a trial being done for menopause using platelet-rich plasma. And the other one, which is the big one, I think everyone has heard a number of stories about Silicon Valley billionaires wanting to inject themselves with teenagers' blood. This is also um, starting to move into that uh, pay-to-participate uh, pay or pay-to-play clinical trial space. There's a business here in Southern California that does it, 8,000 bucks a pop. But I was scooped by Stat News just a couple of days ago where there was, a, it's a very interesting story, there's a Florida business that set itself up as a private membership association hoping to avoid detection by the FDA. And they told their private members that some of our members are doctors and they will enroll you in their clinical study of teenager blood if you pay $285,000. So um, it's, it's the most expensive pay to participate clinical trial that I'm aware of. Um, it's, it's by a guy, he's a cryogenics, fan of cryogenics, he was in the news for in the past creating something called the FDA Holocaust Museum and working with a guy who eventually cut off his deceased mother's head to freeze it in a warehouse in, in Florida. Anyway, a little break before lunch. <laughs> Happy to take questions. Give me something to talk about. <laughs> I think there is, um, you know, we can do one or two quick questions and, and you can otherwise discuss over lunch. One thing I'll mention, I, I like your, this is a common uh, question, the, the, the metaphor of these illicit stem cell clinics being a cancer on the field. Because the other thing is, you know, cancer not only expands, it inhibits the growth of the good healthy cells. So actually that these clinics being out there, it confuses the field. Um, resources are going where it's not warranted and it's, it's avoiding, um, you know, we're all biased, but what we think we should be doing. Yep. So if there's a question or not. Anything? All right, everybody's eager for lunch, so we can discuss there and then we'll meet again afterwards. Great, thanks. Thanks. Great.